Well, good afternoon to all of you. Um, I am really delighted to be here today. Uh, this is my 50th country in the last 23 months as special representative. Uh, so celebrate my 50th anniversary uh, with you today and, uh, and to tell you it's a great pleasure to be in Ottawa. Um, what I thought we would do today is um, I'll talk a little bit about why there is a special representative to Muslim communities at the U.S. Department of State, what the Secretary of State asked me to do, what I'm seeing on the ground. But I would like to spend the bulk of my time getting questions from you so we can have a conversation uh, about my work and about things that are on your mind um, and data points that, that I think are going to be quite um, apparently uh, move forward in terms of key issues that we're all thinking about as we read the paper uh, every day. Um, so it should come as no surprise to you that the United States is engaging with Muslims in a very new way in this administration because you all uh, understand very clearly that President Obama, from the moment he became president on the steps of the, of the Capitol, in his inauguration speech, spoke to Muslims around the world and said he wanted to build new relationships with Muslims around the world uh, based on mutual interest and mutual respect. Uh, a couple of months after he gave his inauguration address, he went to Turkey and spoke to the Turkish parliament and again echoed the same vision. But it was in Cairo in June of 2009 that the president laid out his vision of engagement, uh, talked about the many tools that are in our toolbox, um, ways in which we as the United States can build bridges and build dialogue with Muslims around the world, whether it is on things such as education or science and technology, or entrepreneurship, or poverty, or whatever the issues may be, that it was very critical that the United States do more than we've ever done before to expand relationships, to increase the opportunity to hear from each other, and to be more creative and innovative about the way in which we are building uh, capacity and uh, relationships with one fourth of humanity. So uh, that was very clearly stated by our president, our commander in chief, as to what he wanted our whole of government to do. And I have to tell you that the pace and the passion and the interest and the dedication of every part of government has been to make sure that his vision in Cairo was implemented in a wide variety of ways. So whether you are the US Trade and Development Agency, whether you are the US Agency for International Development, whether you are the Department of State where I work, we are seeing our departments and agencies try to be more creative about how we are expanding the president's vision. So two weeks after the president gave his speech in Cairo, Secretary Clinton uh, announced the Office of the Special Representative to Muslim Communities and, and announced that I would be the special representative. It is the first time in American history we have a special representative and we have somebody uh, working with our embassies in this way. Now, engagement with faith communities in all kinds of civil society is not new to America. We engage in a wide variety of ways. Some of you in this room are Fulbright Fellows. Some of you in this room have been part of international visitor programs. Some of you in this room have attached uh, and understand the cultural events that we have done around the world. Engagement is part of what we do in terms of relationship building. But there's something very different that's happening now. Um, the Secretary of State has asked all of our embassies to be more uh, innovative about how we think about connectivity with one-fourth of humanity. The Office of the Special Representative has a very specific mandate. We are engaging on a people-to-people -people level, and that is critical. While we have very important relationships on a government-to-government -government piece and multilateral conversations with international organizations, what we are doing is really going community to community and look, looking at the nuances of an approach that means that there's no cu cookie cutter for a country even. Obviously, a Toronto is not an Ottawa. I mean, I, 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 as we think very specifically about regions and about communities, who makes up those communities? Who's part of civil society? So my job is to engage community to community with our embassies around the world, Muslims and Muslim-majority countries, and Muslims that live as minorities. So I have a global mandate. The other piece of this that is very important is that the Secretary asked me to look at the youth demographic. And I say that not because people who are older don't matter. It's because when you look at the demographics of Muslims worldwide, 1.6 billion Muslims, one-fourth of humanity, most of those Muslims are under the age of 30. How do we think about what is happening to that generation? What's taking place around the world? I call it a youth quake. Things and the ideas and the innovation and the ripple effect 
of ideas has made a tremendous difference in terms of the way we think about policy, but also in terms of the, thing, the ways we think about culture and innovation and what's possible. The spreading of ideas in this age of participation means that Muslims in Sao Paulo are connected to Muslims in, in Kuala Lumpur. It means that a Muslim in Stockholm is as Muslim to us as a Muslim in Surabaya. The way the United States government is engaging is to take effort and, uh, in making sure that we are giving a dignified and respectful approach to the diversity of Muslims around the world, the stories that are taking place, and the importance of the shift of demographics that are taking place. So in the work that I've been doing the last two and a half years, we are really thrilled to be able to listen to what young people have to say. We are taking the time to work at the grassroots level, to go to places where the US Embassy hasn't gone before, to go deep and go wide, to get to know the voices of the next generation and move those voices forward. Now, if we think about the narratives that are taking place worldwide, the sound bites and the media stereotypes about how we talk about Muslims around the world. There are very narrow visions of what it means to be Muslim on the planet in 2011. And very importantly, and very, very badly, actually, this is a very bad data point, there is a, um, a, a cross-cutting theme of an us and a them. Now, President Obama has talked about the fact that there is no us and them, there's just an us. And if you think about the movement of the piece that was written in 1993 by Sam Huntington on the clash of civilizations, you think about the progressive ideas that have been moved forward to suggest that there is some sort of West versus Islam or us versus them. We have to debunk those kinds of narratives. We have to reframe and recatalyze what it means to be a Muslim on the planet in 2011. And to do that, you have to listen to what the young people are saying, how they're defining themselves, what are the issues that they're talking about, what makes the difference to them. This is what we're trying to do with our embassies around the world. And our initiatives and our engagement is all about listening to what these young people have to say, move their ideas forward, and connect their ideas to each other. Why is that important? By connecting their ideas, you're building new networks of voices that can debunk old stereotypes, and importantly, reframe issues, and importantly, uh, catalyze new narratives through these new networks. So because we know that the, the framework of an us and them is an incorrect framework, by amplifying new voices, by demonstrating that we're listening to what a young person has to say, by moving their stories, their ideas forward, you're beginning to seed a new sense of what it means to be young and Muslim on the planet today. The work that we've done um, has been really inspirational for me in, in this one regard. Though there is so much diversity uh, with Muslims around the world, and I, as I've said, that's very important that we, we talk about it in this way, there's one theme that has been consistent around the world. This generation that's grown up in a post 9-11 world is struggling with an issue of identity. What does it mean to be modern and Muslim? What is the difference between religion and culture? Because the sound bites and the stereotypes uh, along with the largest megaphone out there, which is the megaphone of those voices who would like you to believe that Muslims are separate and need to belong somewhere else, has actually had a very negative impact on the way these young people are growing up. And these young people, think about it, every single day since September 12, 2001, have grown up with the word Islam or Muslim on the front page of a paper online and offline. There's no other generation in history in which young people have had the responsibility of uh, talking about themselves in this way because the whole world is reconstructing uh, and reanalyzing who they are. So this navigation of identity is a very central and pivotal point to how we think about uh, what is taking place with these young people. To, to get past some of the stereotyping, it means that we need to amplify those new stories, the new initiatives, the new ideas that come from these young people. So the connectivity of these ideas is powerful. The way we think about policy is very important because this youthquake matters, and the ideas matter that they are seeding uh, around the world. 
the ability to harness an incredible idea from an entrepreneur in Ottawa and connect them with an entrepreneur, for example, in Nouakchott, Mauritania, means that you need to be able to say, you and you need to meet because you're doing and talking about the same thing. This kind of connectivity is what we're doing around the world. And we're amplifying the opportunities to hear different stories, to reframe the narrative, and to push back against old stereotypes that are not accurate and are actually very destructive in terms of how we talk about things. Now, the other piece of, of what I do uh, around the world is to have the opportunity to not only connect these voices, but to seed ideas that come from the people themselves. Um, and that's been one of the most powerful things that we've been able to do. By listening to what communities have to say about what's needed, you're able to say, well, where can we be of help? Um, it's not about money, it's also about ideas. So when you talk to that young person that says, you know, what we really need in this community to help change the narrative or help change the stereotype or um, to be part of the solution to a problem on education or literacy or poverty or HIV AIDS or malaria or whatever the issue is you want to work on together, you're able to say, well, that's really powerful what, you're, what you want to work on. Can I connect you to some organizations or some people who are doing the same thing? So we're able to work together on things of common interest, which is what the president has talked about. You cannot work on things with common interest if you haven't built the trust and you haven't built the dialogue. So this initiative is not about uh, a flash in the bucket kind of thing on how popular we are or trying to win hearts and minds. This is about how we invest in the next generation so that we have partners to work on things together that make a difference. And whether we are focusing, as I said, on science and technology or uh, our education or on eradicating malaria, these are things that we as humans have to do. And the only way we can do it is to open up that opportunity for, for dialogue and, and, and the ability to speak um, together uh, on, on how, to, how to solve problems. Um, the final point I, I will say to you in terms of the work that I'm doing around the world is that um, while uh, I'm, I'm painting an opportunity that is very positive, um, I know that I'm looking at some of the, the, the expressions in the audience, there is also clearly um, a lot of, there, there are areas in which there are challenges, and there are areas in which many communities want to talk about issues of foreign policy or other things that are on their mind. The ability to open up the conversation uh, it has meant that we are able to do that as well. The Secretary of State has talked a lot about two things. One is citizen diplomacy, and the other is 21st century statecraft. Citizen diplomacy means that you matter, that you civil society matter, that the voices that are happening on the ground matter to what we are doing as the US government. So the more opportunities that we have at, through our embassies and through other channels to be able to listen to what people have to say is important to us, we want to hear that. The other piece is that by using 21st century statecraft, i.e. Facebook, Twitter, other things that we have going, that allow the average person to be able to interface with senior government officials means that we get to hear things on the ground in real time. Now, for those of you who are on Facebook, I'm on Facebook too. For those of you who tweet, follow me on Twitter. Um, it means that you're being able to, to give uh, an insight and a snapshot as to the kinds of things that I'm doing and seeing on the ground. It also means that you hear something you don't like or you hear something you do like. And you can speak to me directly and say, hey, Farah, that meeting that you just had in London with the CEDAR group uh, talking about interfaith, uh, I thought that was really neat. How do I connect with that group? I'm able to respond immediately and connect people virally, even who don't get the chance to come into a beautiful room like this uh, and talk face to face. So the combination of different approaches and how we're doing things has really made a gigantic difference in the sort of the texture and the nuance and the tone of how we as United States diplomats do our work, but very specifically in the work that I'm doing, it has made a difference to the way in which I hear what communities have to say. The final, final um, is today is the, um, well, today is World Tolerance Day. Um, some of you may know that. Um, I want to tell you about a campaign that was launched um, in my capacity as special representative, but not necessarily through the channels. And I say this because it's an illustration of something that organically came from civil society that has been turned into a worldwide campaign that has taken off in huge ways. Um, last year, uh, I was part of the U.S. delegation that went to Kazakhstan because the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, held a, a meeting on tolerance. 
and delegations uh, that were part of the OSCE came to give uh, their formal presentations on a wide variety of issues. They set it up so that there was a, a panel on anti-Semitism, there was a panel on what they called Islamophobia, there was a panel on what they called Christophobia, uh, and they asked the different governments to speak on these issues. And as the special representative to Muslim communities, I was supposed to speak on Islamophobia. What we did on that day uh, was very important uh, because it was something that was unplanned but really um, critical to an initiative that we launched this past year. My colleague, Hannah Rosenthal, who is the envoy to combat and monitor anti-Semitism. Her job is very different from mine. Her job is congressionally mandated. She is supposed to monitor and combat anti-Semitism around the world. She has to give reports to Congress on these issues. She was supposed to give the formal US presentation on anti-Semitism, and I was supposed to speak on, uh, on Islamophobia. What we did at that conference was we switched roles. Mm -hmm. So when the US was called up onto the stage, the podium, to speak on anti-Semitism, I went up as the special representative to Muslim communities and spoke uh, about anti-Semitism and said I condemn in the strongest terms possible anti-Semitism. And when it was the turn for Islamophobia, Hannah went up and did the same thing. Our, our conclusion paragraphs were the same. Hate is hate, no matter who the victim is. The reason we decided to do that, because in my role and in her role, we had been hearing from our civil society that there was an increase of hate language around the world. Muslims were talking to me about Muslim hatred rhetoric expanding and, and increasing. I also heard and saw a lot about anti-Semitism that was increasing, especially in Europe, that was off the charts, unacceptable and off the charts. And we decided we'd make a statement there at that conference. Now, obviously, the American government doesn't do that all the time. It got a lot of press. It was a really big deal. But here's what I want to tell you. That was a formal thing that happened. But what happened afterwards is civil society came to us. And they said, that was awesome that the United States did that. But what can you do that's action oriented, that moves that idea forward in a new way? And the civil society groups from Bosnia and from America and from different parts of Europe said to us, can you do more? And Hannah and I took that really seriously and thought, OK, this is not our mandate, per se. You just heard what I do for a living, and you just explained what Hannah does. But is there something that we can combine forces to work together? Because coalitions matter, and the messenger matters on these kinds of issues. We did do something. And this past February, we went back, we went back to the OSCE, and we said, a few months ago, we had this event in Kazakhstan. This is what we did. And now we're coming to you to launch a campaign called 2011, like the year 2011, Hours Against Hate. Um, and you will see flyers as you leave. I hope you take one so you learn a little bit about the campaign. We are asking people to go on Facebook and to pledge their time, one hour, 100 hours, 10 hours, it doesn't matter, to do something for someone who doesn't look like you, pray like you, or live like you. This is not just about religion. This is not just about race or sexuality or socioeconomic background. It's about humans taking a stand for their future in terms of how we set the tone for what is acceptable. I'm using this illustration not just because it is World Tolerance Day and because I really would love you to be part of this campaign. We have gotten more than 15,000 hours pledged worldwide uh, for this campaign, and you will see videos on the Facebook page of great groups around the world who have taken this on. But we've catalyzed an initiative that came directly from people uh, on the ground who've asked us to do more. That's the kind of thing that we are trying to do in the work that I'm doing, too, separate from, from this campaign, that we're listening to what civil society says and say, well, OK, you're saying you're having a hard time with this. Is there a way that we, as the United States government, can help you move that idea forward or make it, make it real? Whether it is helping to convene and using our role as the United States government to be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner, or it's saying, again, I love that idea. You know that there's a group that's doing this over here. Can I connect you? Um, it doesn't matter which way we do it, that, what we were, that we are listening to what civil society has to say so that we can do more, expand more, to seed more initiatives that come directly from people who know on the ground that things need to be done. So in this way, we're doing things, um, as I said, people to people. Um, and I would look forward to the questions that I'm going to get from you in terms of other things that I've seen on the ground. But uh, I've given you a, a broad brush stroke of what the Secretary has asked me to do. Um, I will just say to you, I told you I've been to 50 countries around the world. I've been 
all over the world, whether it's the Pamir Mountains or the Sahara Desert. So I want you to ask me questions about what I've seen, because I think you'll find it um, very interesting in terms of what's happening with these young people around the world. Uh, thank you for your patience, and I look forward to the Q&A.